Welcome to the Luke Macias Show. Guys, I am joined today by our new chairman of the Texas GOP, Abraham George. And so we're going to have a conversation about a couple things regarding the Republican Party, where it's at, and where it is going. But before we get there, I do want to talk about the debacle that the Democrat Party convention was. So uh, if you didn't follow it online at all, I'm going to give you the very quick overview. Essentially, big picture, is that the Democrat Party actually ran, uh, they had so few people attending their convention that the chairman of the Democrat Party actually had to close down the convention for lack of a quorum. There's a lot of people that believe that this was actually intentional. Um, people don't understand, but we actually have this establishment and kind of, let's say, outsider battle happening in the Democrat Party in Texas. But the establishment, think of it as the Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton wing of the GO of the Democrat Party, and then the outsiders like the AOC, Bernie Sanders wing of the Democrat Party. And so those activists were trying to beef up a stronger platform and rules for the Democrat Party of Texas, and the establishment did not want that to happen. And so essentially, they got enough people to leave to end the convention and say that there was not a quorum. And uh, Mr. Hinojosa, who's the chairman of the Democrat Party, literally just said, there's not a quorum and we are not going to be able to finish this convention. They're probably ran past their time, owe a bunch of convention fees. They are reverting back to their old platform and rules, just like what would have happened two years ago. The establishment tried to do this at our convention when they actually tried to run the clock out on our new rules and our new platform that were stronger, that were strengthened even more so this last convention, which we talked about last week. So if you haven't watched our episode last week, go back. We can kind of overview all the things that happened to the convention. So we're not going to cover all that with Abraham today. We're going to talk about several other things. But at the Democrat Party, they literally had enough people leave to break quorum and say, we don't have a quorum here. I guess Democrats like breaking quorum. They broke quorum in the Texas House. Then they, the establishment broke quorum at, at the, their own convention to stop more uh, progressive rules and platform from passing. So it's been quite a debacle. They also uh, had a drag queen get up. I, I, can't, I can't figure out whether this is a woman who became a man, tried to make herself a man, and then dresses still like a woman, or if it's born man dressing like woman. There's all sorts of reports out there. So we have not figured out how many back and forths the individual that got up at the Democrat Party convention has gone through to present themselves as they currently present themselves, but a rather crazy turn of events. And the Democrat Party just continues to embrace this really radical leftist shift. And so, hence us having a conversation uh, today with the Texas GOP. But with that uh, being covered, I wanna go to my conversation um, with Chairman George. Chairman George, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I remember a conversation we had pretty quickly after your loss in March. Uh, you know, I think most people know your background, but you were on the SREC, Collin County GOP chair, run for the legislature, got outspent, I think seven to one, and uh, still only lost by, I don't know, four, 5% or so. Um, and then we had a conversation relatively soon after that, and there were a lot of conservatives reaching out to you saying, hey, what do you think about potentially running for Texas GOP chair? When, when you know, you've, you've done a lot and succeeded in a lot of things in the GOP, and, but nobody likes losing their race. So what was the mindset coming off of a loss of a campaign you put your all into to, hey, do you want to go run for Texas GOP chair? Well, I think you probably remember this, that I said, okay, what are the chances of winning this? And if I win, what will be the major hurdles that we're going to have to face? And we talked about a few things, and I said, I'm going to have to have the freedom to uh, push the priorities in a, such a way that we're going to actually make it happen. And we talked about Matt Rinaldi at that point and said, hey, is it going to be Matt Rinaldi 2.0? And I said, that's the only way I would want to do this. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is, a, I'm, I'm happy and I'm, I'm encouraged that the people actually saw that and made that decision. But it was a hard battle yes. I mean, all day. And and on Friday, and especially uh, probably about two months of uh, very hard campaign throughout the state of Texas. So that was I remember uh, you were talking to a bunch of people and, you know, you're like, hey, I, 
I kind of came off this campaign. I don't really want to travel. And all of us are like, hey, it's not really travel. And then like a month later, you're like, I haven't been home in a month. <laughs> I've been driving across the whole state meeting with all these people. Texas is huge. You, yes. you really don't know until you start driving every day for 10 hours. Yes. It's just like, it is absolutely. I mean, but it's a beautiful country to drive though. Uh, any place you go, it's just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Rinaldi's like the worst person to talk to if you want to run for chair because he basically is like, it's the worst job ever. Don't do it. Takes all your time. Um, but I think what, what Matt has always said and what you've clearly made clear in your service with the SREC and GOP chairs, y you know the impact that these party leaders have on the process. So when you were calling GOP chair, you engage not only in building the party up in a suburban county um, that's getting increasingly competitive, but also in speaking into the desire to move legislation. And um, that is kind of been the, sh re let's say, paradigm shift that's happened in the GOP over the last several years and several administrations. And so you told the delegates, if you like what the GOP is doing, how we've engaged and said, we not only want to win elections, but we also want to advance our legislation, then that's what I'm running. Several people ran on, you know, kind of just, just doing the election stuff, right. stay out of the intra-party disagreements. Yep. Um, and so the delegates ultimately select you to lead the party. What, what kind of mandate do you feel like you have coming off of that victory? Well, during my campaign, I made it very clear saying, okay, if you want a cheerleading squad type of party where it's, we're going to have galas and awards and all of that stuff uh, every few months and we're just going to pat each other on the back saying, hey, we're a Republican state, I'm not your guy. I don't have the personality for it and I just don't want to do it. If you want a someone who is actually going after uh, our priorities to get passed, uh, go to legislators and say, okay, this is the mandate, you need to do this because you are running on our platform, you are running on our name, uh, and you're wearing our jersey, you're gonna have to score points for our team. If that's the kind of party you want, I'm your guy. So it was a drastic difference between some of my opponents and myself, and then and, and I understand why they're saying what they're saying, because they want the party to be stronger in finance and things like that, but they want this, this uni-party type of things that comes together where everyone's happy about everyone else, but in my opinion, uh, we are not in a place in our country to have that kind of luxury where everyone is just happy about everything else is going on. So uh, it, was, it was wonderful to see that a lot of people during my campaign and you know, going to South Texas to everywhere else, it's people will come and say, you know what, I love Matt and we, what he did is great. If he can continue to do that, or if he can take it to the next level, uh, and they will say, we, we, you know, we didn't like Matt on some tiny thing, but we don't care about that because we want the priorities to be passed. Yes. And so it was, it was a great messaging from the grassroots to the leadership saying, okay, this is what we want. This is why we're electing Abraham. Uh, it, we're not electing someone else who wants the uni party type of uh, uh, process moving forward. So uh, it, it's great. We. Uh have now seen the Texas GOP priorities, right? Y'all released those to the delegates. And um, what always happens is when the priorities come out, which are great pieces of policy, yes. all very conservative policy. I'm not gonna, I, I don't know if we've memorized them at this point, but it's, you know, property, um, it's, okay, we have election integrity, border security, very robust border security measures, um, federal overreach, uh, the grid, protecting the grid, um, and I'm trying to remember on, on all taxpayer of, funded lobbying, tax, banning taxpayer funded lobbyists. Right. Yep. Right. Um, every time this happens, there are a number of people who go, oh my gosh, the issue I care a lot about is not a legislative priority. And I, I feel like sometimes activists feel like if it's not a priority, then it means that the party is not pushing to pass it. So the two issues I hear most about right now, and you can add any that you think you also hear is. Um, eliminating first M and O property taxes, your school property taxes, and then the rest of your property tax bill, and then school choice, which is a you know priority of the governor and is in the platform. So, can you tell activists what your position is on those issues and what the party's position will be, and then also any other issues that you're getting feedback from saying, "Hey, why wasn't this a priority? Why wasn't that a priority?" 
Well, we are a bottoms up party, right? So the convention comes together and 9,000 some people chooses their priorities. Uh, but property tax and a school choice have been our some of our top priorities for a few years. We've got some uh, legislation on that, but I think we we need to move forward with that as well. So I haven't quite figured out how to do this. Uh, there are multiple options for the chair to make the make those two as uh, additional special priorities, things like that. So we're looking at all of that. One thing I want to make it clear is we will support and push for eliminating property tax. We will support and push for school choice. Um, Honestly, I think we're going to get that. Some of the legislators, lawmakers, all, already came out uh, with the top priorities of the top eight. Then they add these two or three more, uh, which is a great way to look at it. I mean, just because it, it didn't make it to the top eight, it doesn't mean the party's not going to support it, party's not going to work for it. So we will make sure of that. And many of the SREC members are already on it. Yeah, so. The, uh, if something's in the platform, it's something the party wants to see enacted into law. That's right. And the platform's huge. Yes. And there's hundreds of planks. So if if the policy you hear about is a platform plank, the party supports and believes in seeing those planks enacted into law. Absolutely. So the platform, you know, I remember, you, I'm, you remember this because we were there together. On, on Thursday night, I'm sorry, Friday night, we had to come back after the gala. Yep. We stayed there until about 11.45 or 11.50 because people care so much about their platform uh, and, and all of those plays. We, these grassroots members who are not, doesn't have any title, they're spending thousands of dollars to be in San Antonio and working another four hours after a 12 to 16 hour yes. day. Yes. Uh, so it means a lot to them. And I think our legislators are supposed to and should look at that in with that gravitas saying, okay, our people, my constituents care so much about it. They spend so many hours on it. Um, and they've been debating about it for weeks now. So uh, from all the way from the precinct chair conventions, all the way to state conventions. So we will be pushing for our platforms and our priorities. Yeah. Um, right after you won, there were a number of people there. And one of the things you said, cause, cause this campaign got pretty grueling, right? I mean, people, it, it, you were getting more attacks than all of your opponents combined. Yeah. And, uh, and this isn't anything against any of your opponents. Cause a lot of them weren't in any way involved in those attacks. Right. But y you said, you know, when all these attacks were coming, the people who were supporting you stuck with you. Right. And they continued. So what is your message? Because a lot of those people watch and listen to this show. I mean, I met a lot of them during convention and they said, hey, so I know that a lot of those delegates get their information here. What is your message to them? People that you met along the way that stuck with you and then through a myriad of attacks continued to stay with you all the way till the chairmanship. Well, uh, two things. One, I want to first, I want to thank them for that because it is uh, it was tough on them to explain to their fellow uh, precinct chairs or fellow delegates from their county saying, why are you supporting Abraham after all of this stuff is about, you know, all the negative ads and negative attacks. And they continually pushed back and they even got more people to come and support me. So one thing, it was tougher on them than sometimes on me because they had to explain it and they didn't have all the facts. Uh, but one thing I want to make sure that I, I make it very clear to them is that during the campaign, they saw that I'm genuinely supporting our platform, our priorities, and that's why they, they stuck with me. And they didn't really care about all the negative ads. And I had more people come to me and say, you know, just I was not sure about you, but when this came out, I knew you were the guy because yep. they were coming after you for a reason. Uh, so I want to make it very clear to them saying, I will continue to work. I'm not going to change my demeanor and become more moderate. Uh, I'm, I will continue to work uh, in the same manner that all the promises that I made during my campaign saying, you know, we will push, uh, we will get elected official will get our Republicans elected, but we will also hold them accountable. We will push our platforms and our priorities. Uh, that is more important to me than, um, you know, having a gala one day somewhere in, in, in Austin. It, because at the end of the day, 20 years from now, nobody cares who was the Republican Party chair. What matters is 
where we stand as Texas and what did Republican Party did in 2024, uh, what what that means for our children and, and their, their grandchildren. So, Are you worried about your kid's future? You should be. I'm Charles Blaine with Texas Tomorrow. This is a show where we're gonna talk about the issues and the people that are pushing the policies that concern your family, your home, and your kids. Catch Texas Tomorrow every Thursday. Uh, you mentioned some of these state reps, and I've seen a lot of them online. Um, a lot of the contract with Texas signers and then like Ben Bumgarner and several other state representatives who basically, when the Texas GOP priorities came out, said, hey, these are great policies. Let's pass them into law. Some, like you said, even added to them. They said, hey, these are great eight. Here's my 12. Now, legislators vote on like well over a thousand things every single session, right? So you're just saying, hey, while you're passing 1500 things, can you make 12 of them these? Um, the Republican Party of Texas has had great relationships with Texas senators, congressmen, statewide officials, but where there's always been tension has been between the Texas GOP and some Republicans in the Texas House, right? And a couple of them even came out, I think Carl Tepper from Lubbock, who doesn't seem to want to build a relationship with you, by the way, just in case you're wondering, uh, came out and said, these are a bunch of rhinos because they haven't, they don't want to eliminate property tax and they don't want school choice. Yeah. Acting like you personally were against these policies, right? So the, somebody like Carl clearly just wants a fight. But what should a Republican state representative do if their goal is to not be at war with the Texas GOP like maybe their caucus has been in the past, what is the path that you see for them to have a better, more healthy relationship like that of the Texas Senate, U.S. congressmen, statewide officials? Well, I think the starting with not giving power to Democrats. It's a, it has to be, it's a very simple issue. It's not hard. We're the Republican Party. You ran as a Republican. Don't give power to the Democrats because the Republican Party and the grassroots are working hard to get you elected on November against a Democrat, then there, it doesn't make any sense for any Republican elected official to go and, and empower Democrats. It just doesn't make any sense. So st that's a good start. We got to start there. And the second one we talked about is electing a speaker who will not hinder with our Republican priorities and our platform. Uh, that will come down to lot of dynamics, um, uh, you know, but 46 members have signed on to saying, hey, we will support a speaker who will, uh, who we will only support a speaker who will not put a Democrat in a committee chair, which is a great start from that 46 members. And these are, uh, these are great members who some of them are incoming people, some of them been there for a while. Uh, the rest of the caucus, another 40 of them uh, or so, this is the perfect time for them to come and join the party and the rest of their majority of the caucus actually, and say, you know what, we we hear you. Uh, one of the one of the um, speaker candidate Tom actually talked about, you know, they might, this might not be my stand if you had asked me three years ago or four years ago or something like that, but I changed my mind on this because I see Democrats killing our priorities. Yes. So it's not a, there's no shame in saying, okay, we did support this in the past, but we understand this is not a, it's not good for us, good for our party or for the state. So we wanna move over and say, we're not gonna support. And this is, and we want to cheer for that group. We wanna get those members on our side and say, we wanna work with you, uh, let's figure this out. So that's my messaging to the rest of the, the people who haven't signed on to uh, that pledge uh, that we really want them to come to our side. Uh, this is not a, I would rather fight Democrats all day, every day than yes. go against the Republican uh, because any Republican is better than a Democrat. Of the five most competitive seats in November, I believe three of the five have signed that commitment on Democrat chairs, which is Mark LaHood in San Antonio, Don McLaughlin, which would be a flip seat in Uvalde, Steve Kennard up in Plano. And so one very basic thing they've said is, my choice for speaker is gonna be different than my Democrat opponent's choice for speaker. And other Republicans who haven't signed it that are in competitive districts, like Republicans still don't know whether their choice for speaker 
is the same as their Democrat opponent's choice for speaker in November. And imagine a Democrat being like, hey, if I get elected, I'm going to vote for the same speaker he's going to vote for. You're going, what's wrong with this? What's, what's the problem? What's yeah, the exactly? Yeah. So you can't be upset that the party wants to focus on trying to build unity around saying, we want to actually have very clear, stark differences between you, your Democrat opponent, and how you're going to empower Republicans in the chamber and how we move forward. I. I do think um, you're right that with the 46 signing that statement, they made it clear, hey, we're moving in a new direction. There's a new paradigm. And there's still a lot of time for the rest of the 40 to make the right decision and say, let's, let's lower our battles. I've always thought this. Right now, the Texas GOP has really high intraparty battles. They're, they're high temperature battles. Like the Texas House told the attorney general, we literally just want you in jail, maybe, prison, you know, not in office, kicked out forever. You can never run for anything. That's a really big disagreement. You're not disagreeing on like what your appropriation number should be. With Sid Miller, it's been the same thing. With the Texas GOP, should you even get elected at the convention? Should you be able to close your primary? So the disagreements are relatively high, which have meant we've been in these huge battles in the primary. But it seems like we're moving in a direction where our intraparty disagreements, if we have the right leadership in the House, and you and the governor and the lieutenant governor and the senator, where our disagreements could be much smaller, which means we have way smaller intraparty battles moving forward. I would, we would, we should be, and we would rather be fighting the Democrats. And only reason we get into this intraparty problems is a small group of people always want to side with the Democrats. And the Republican, the rest of the Republicans are looking like, no, 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 this is the Republican party. You, you should be moving to this side. This is, here's the team, join us, and we're playing on the same team. Uh, but some reason, I don't know what it is, they seem to move to the other side once in a while and sometimes just get stuck there because of campaign finances, whatever it is. And it is, it is our job, it is our responsibility to pull them back into the into yeah. the fold. And uh, we have a few months to do that. Yeah. Um, there's this closed primary that people are talking about, a rule change in the Texas, um, in, at the Texas GOP to close the primary. Last week, for anybody listening or watching this show, they can go back to last week's because I actually go in relatively de big detail about how it's happened and in other states and all that. So we don't need to go into all the technicalities of it. But one thing that set you apart from some of your opponents, not all of them, but some of them, was your position on closing the primary by rule and then backing that up. So just tell us in closing what the party's posture is going to be on closing its primary. What do you think you're going to have to do from now till at whatever point the decision's made on how we enforce that rule change? Right. So I think I would rather have the legislators take care of this, but knowing a lot of the legislators are against it, uh, we will probably end up in court. I think we're going to end up in court either way. Uh, so we're probably going to move forward with that. We're fundraising for it now. We're going to work on it. It is not a choice anymore because the, the, the convention literally did that. The convention said we're closing the primaries. They closed down the rules. It's my job. It's the SRAC's job to go and make it happen and execute this. Uh, and we're, our timeline is very short because we're hoping for 2026. Uh, in a few months, that primary comes to our side. The, the fact that some Republicans are against closing primaries is just crazy because the only reason that you would be against closing primaries is if, if you want some Democrats to support you mm -hmm. during your primary election and maybe another conservative will come in and they're only going to get the Republican support and you want some Democrats to come over. Uh, we saw that all over state of Texas this time. So party's not going to take a back seat on this. We're going to lead the charge on this. We're going to make sure that we have a close primary. Um, it, it's a done deal from the convention. Abraham, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Do you want to get your news from people who share your values? Texas Scorecard, real news for real Texans.